So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my privilege and honor to introduce you our guests, distinguished professors and participants of this, this seminar, which is dedicated to the ongoing war in Ukraine. We'll talk about non-European perspectives. So let me introduce you in order of appearance, Professor Edward Halinrak, representing the University of Warsaw, uh, Professor Rajendra Jain, representing Jawaharlal Nehru University from India, uh, Professor Roberto Rabel, representing uh, Victoria University of Wellington. Both professors, both Professor Jain and Professor Rabel, are now visiting professors at the University of Warsaw. And I, are you happy with your stay in Warsaw? Thank you very much. Yeah. Absolutely. Happy. Uh, we also have uh, Professor Wojciech Grabowski from the University of Gdańsk, who will pre uh, present the Middle Eastern perspective on the conflict. And we also have uh, uh, Rafał Wiśniewski, who represents mm -hmm the Faculty of Political Science and Journalism at Adam Mickiewicz University. And my name is Przemysław Osiewicz, and I also represent the Faculty of, of Political Science and Journalism, and my name and surname are very hard to pronounce. But yeah, <laughs> at least Wojciech and Rafał know how to do that, and Professor Halijak also. So. Without further ado, we'll have, uh, during this seminar, we agreed that um, all participants will uh, present uh, they uh, I mean the perspectives of the of the countries or of the regions on the ongoing conflict in in in, in Ukraine. So um, each participant will be given like ten minutes for his part, and then we'll continue with discussion. If there are any questions, the uh, all uh, all people watching us right now on YouTube, um, uh, feel free to to. Um, ask uh, questions using the chat option, right? So the chat option is now open. You can you can ask your questions uh, using this chat window. So without further ado, I will begin with uh, Professor Halijak, who will um, tell us more about the Chinese perspective. So first, so what is what's the perspective of the People's Republic of China on the ongoing uh, conflict in in Ukraine? Who knows? Uh, <laughs> this is a uh, uh, this is a great challenge. How to reconstruct the China's position? Nevertheless, I'd like to point uh, out two things. First, Russia invasion on Ukraine is the most uh, profound uh, change in international system since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1990. One. This is the first. Second, uh, Russia-Ukrainian war is a continuation of a Cold War. I argue that Cold War has not ended in 1991 tentatively, but was frozen for a while and now is revived again. What is the uh, attitude and posi uh, China's position toward it? Uh, when I, I am studying the China's reaction, I discovered that for China, for now, for China, the most important uh, thing is the uh, state of China's economy. China is mostly preoccupied with, the, with its economy. The shape of China's economy is not good now. And probably there is a possibility that China economy would contract for the first time since the Deng reform. This is the, due to the, to the zero COVID, uh, zero COVID uh, policy. So this is the main preoccupation. This is unintended consequences, for instance, for the oil prices. The lower demand from China make uh, oil prices more moderate and help Western countries to, uh, to, resign, uh, to resign from oil uh, import from the, from the Russia. My main assumption is such on China's position. China is highly disappointed with Ukraine war, not because of uh, Russia invasion as such, 
but because of the consequences, international consequences of this invasion. That is the increased cohesion of the Western bloc under the umbrella of the United States. China see Russian invasion as a, uh, as a, uh, uh, as a, as a cause of this uh, not very welcome effect. The West, before the war, the West was, according, uh, was in the state of disorder, uh, uh, um, chaos, and competition between Western Europe and the United States. After the Russia invasion, West became more cohesive and integrated, and this is the against of the interest of China. Surprisingly, in recent days and weeks, China gave a strong support, for instance, for the uh, European Union, for the European, uh, for the European Union. She said, Chinese president, the security of Europe should be kept in the hands of Europeans themselves. One sentence more important. China support strategic autonomy of the European Union. This is the word of the Xi Jinping. Why uh, suddenly China supports strategic uh, autonomy? Because China want to uh, want to weaken the transatlantic uh, relations. Strategic autonomy, when we look at the origin and the evolution of this concept, always was treated as an alternative to the NATO structure. To the NATO structure. And strategic, uh, and was supported by the France and Germany. It's very interesting that this opinion of uh, uh, China was expressed during the uh, video conference uh, between Xi and the German Chancellor Scholz. German Chancellor Scholz. So, China is uh, for China unified Western camp. That is the NATO countries plus Asian ally like uh, Japan, Republic of Korea, Taiwan, Australia, and New Zealand, five big democracies plus India. There are hope that India will join this uh, democratic uh, Asian camp. Will be the uh, will be the block of a democratic camp against authoritarian uh, author, uh, authoritarian uh, authoritarian camp so the aim of china is to uh, is to split the cohesion of the uh, of the west so from this point of view china is extremely angry on russia and putin because uh, Russia gave an impetus for such Western cohesion. Western cohesion. As far uh, as a direct uh, position, China's position, China see the uh, see this uh, this war as a European war, as an intra-European conflict. China want to uh, isolate this conflict from the Asia. And China argued that this conflict should not be linked with the Indo-Pacific, with the, uh, uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, uh, Indo there is also another interesting, you know, uh, contradiction in China attitude. First of all, uh, China, was, China is in a very difficult position because always China, uh, China, 
Just to say that there are principles, non-intervention, territorial integrity, and sovereignty. These are the norms of China foreign policy. They stated since the Deng reform, on every occasion, they stated that these are the fundamentals of the international relations. So, interestingly, that such words were recalled by the Chinese ambassador to Ukraine. This is the very low uh, level. These words were not stated by the Minister of Foreign Affairs or she, or she, because the official, in official language, Chinese official language, this is the uh, Russia-Ukraine war, and they try to avoid the word invasion. The word of invasion do not exist in Chinese political uh, discourse. This is a war. It uh, implied that both countries are, play, are, blame, uh, uh, are blamed for this conflict, Russia as well as, uh, as, uh, as, Ukra as Ukraine. So, and last thing, China is uh, much afraid of U.S. sanction against, uh, against uh, its country, so China is pursuing very cautious relations with Russia. China uh, do not support officially uh, Russia aggression. At the voting, at the uh, General Assembly on uh, March 2nd this year, China abstain. I'd like you to remind you that this voting was very important. 141 countries support, uh, condemn Russia. Five uh, countries uh, support only, and 40, including India and China, abstain. This is very, uh, very important. Uh, 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 very, uh, it was a very important event because it shows how the international community react to the Russia, uh, to the, uh, to the Russia, uh, to the Russia uh, aggression. So China, being afraid of imposing sanctions for developing any relations with uh, Russia, try to limit its contact with Russia its economic contacts, uh, financial support, technological, uh, the, the, the delivering of technology or something uh, like that. China is very cautious not to be blamed on supporting, on directly supporting uh, Russia, uh, Russia in this, uh, in this, uh, in this, con uh, in this conflict. So, uh, formerly, China uh, occupied a uh, occupied uh, neutral position, but emotionally, China is linked with the Putin and Russia. Officially, China try not to be uh, linked with Russia, but emotionally. And the last but not the last, months ago, there were a. Uh, uh, there was an article published in one of a newspaper in a journal on a public opinion in China, made by Count Carter Center from the United States. They use very sophisticated techniques, and they uh, and they publish this uh, results. Seventy-five percent of Chinese population support Russia, but support Russia only morally and 70% of Chinese population support idea of mediation in this, uh, in this, in this, uh, in this conflict. So, uh, uh, summing up, China is in favor of Russia, and China is at the same time against the Russia. So, this is China try to play on multi-level, multi-level uh, games. Thank you very Thank much, you. Professor. Professor Jain, what's the, what's the Indian perspective? What's the perspective of India? Because Professor Halijak mentioned India a few times, so I think he <coughs> you, you to comment on, on 
Ever since I arrived about a four, uh, about 10 days before the innovation began, you know, there's been very passionate discussion in Poland as a frontline state about the, uh, the war in Ukraine. And so I'm grateful to the organizers to at least give an opportunity because the Indian perspective is often less misunderstood. Now, a couple of days before the invasion began, you know, the Indian foreign minister said that the situation in Ukraine was a result of a complex chain of circumstances over the last 30 years. Uh, that is a situation in Ukraine, that is a day before the invasion, has its roots in post-Soviet politics, the expansion of NATO and the dynamics between Russia and Europe, as well as Russia and the West, broadly speaking. It's true that India has abstained on a dozen uh, resolutions, but abstention by itself does not mean that India supports Russia. And I will go on to elaborate what are some of its compulsions, why it has chosen this path. You know, India has not gone into the business of apportioning blame on either side, either Russia or Ukraine, but it has instead insisted on the immediate cessation of hostilities and the resolution of differences through diplomacy and dialogue. Subsequently, you know, India emphasized the importance of the UN Charter, international law, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of states, and it unequivocally condemned the killings in Bucha and supported call for an independent investigation into the deeply disturbing reports of what went on there. Uh, and it has often stressed that the global order is anchored on international law, the UN Charter, and respect for territorial integrity and the sovereignty of states. Now, the choice in not deliberately and specifically condemning Russia is actually shaped by a number of factors. The immediate number one factor was that India was considerably restrained and focused on ensuring the safety of 22,500 Indian students. That is about 25% of the total international students in Ukraine. By 23rd February, that is a day before the invasion, only around 4,000 Indian nationals had left Ukraine. That means 18,000 Indian citizens remain in Ukraine, and many of them were in the difficult cities of Kharkiv and Sumy. By mid-March, we had completed the evacuation, and including 147 citizens from 18 countries. So in these circumstances, immediately, tactically, in the initial uh, few weeks, India could not tilt towards either side. And now a very crucial factor behind India's abstention is that even though over the past five years we have considerably diversified our military dependence, uh, and Russia only today accounts for about 49% of our military hardware, but Russia is very crucial for the majority of maintenance of the majority of our tanks, aircraft, missiles, um, and this is actually very crucial, apart from the fact that, you know, we have purchased the S-400 uh, missiles to deal with China, uh, they lease nuclear submarines to us, and are engaged in a number of, you know, co-production uh, activities. So therefore, you know, the decade-long dependence on Russia cannot be possibly replaced overnight. At the same time, a less understood, you know, reality uh, in Europe and particularly in Poland is that Ukraine is equally important for us. I'll explain why. For instance, the uh, Indian Space Research Organization's semi-cryogenic engine is being developed based on the Ukrainian uh, engine. Eight Indian warships are getting the turbines from Ukraine, some being built in Russia, the rest on transfer of technology in Goa. Uh, and they are also responsible for the upgradation of our AN-32 transport planes, you know. Um, and, you know, in the past couple of years, we've signed a number of defense agreements for the maintenance of a variety of military equipment. Apart from that, you know, uh, Ukraine has been a major supplier of sunf sunf uh, sunflower oil, and we have had to diversify. And Argentina has, as a result, emerged as a very big partner because we have now had the compulsion to do it. And one thing which is not known in Poland at all is that India has shipped over 90 tons of humanitarian relief, of medicines or other relief equipment to Ukraine. Now, one factor which the Europeans often tend to overlook is the fact that uh, India is actually confronting China across the line of actual control, where 200,000 Chinese troops are engaged in an eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball confrontation. 
uh, uh, over a disputed area, which is about 2,200 miles. And in this context and in this scenario, you know, India's partnership with Russia, especially for continued spares and supplies, has become extremely crucial. One more factor which uh, Professor Halizak briefly referred to is that there is great concern in India about closer Russia-China ties. Um, and we feel that the war in Ukraine is driving the, China, the Russians closer in the Chinese embrace. Uh, and uh, there is concern that if Russia's dependence on China deepens, especially in the energy sector, when the West is now uh, trying to close the tap insofar as energy supplies from Russia are concerned, that uh, you know uh, this might have some adverse implications for the privileged partnership between Delhi and Moscow. Uh, and one uh, former minister even wrote that this had the risk of Russia possibly becoming a satellite state of a rising Chinese imperium. Now, whether this happens or not is a different story, but the, the point is clear that uh, a tighter Russo-Japanese embrace has implications for the multipolar Asia and the multipolar world that India seeks. So the reality is that India's problem is China, and it needs both the United States and the West, as well as Russia, to deal with the China problem. Now, there has been a lot of uh, discussion here in Poland, and I've seen repeated references to it, uh, that India is buying a humongous quantity of oil from Russia. You know, this is absolutely far from the truth. The reality is that about 80% of our oil is sourced from uh, the Middle East, and Russia only accounts for 1% to 2% of the oil. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so what India buys or has bought, Europe actually buys in an afternoon. So therefore, you know, you also have to understand that the prices of oil, as uh, Professor Halizak was saying, you know, from last year have jumped from $63 to $100 plus. And on a country trying to recover from two years of the pandemic, you know, there is a severe foreign exchange burden, you know, to buy because uh, there is no easily replaceable at a quick time for this oil. Uh, so I think one should be very clear about this, that despite a large degree of public rhetoric, around the potential oil sales to India from Russia, the United States and other Western countries actually understand India's position at the time of high and volatile uh, prices. Now, let me just conclude by making three or four points clear. First of all, I think it is obvious that much of the world has not taken sides on either Russia or Ukraine, including major non-Western democracies like South Africa, Brazil, and Indonesia. Uh, which have preferred neutrality in this conflict and war. Um, now, almost half of Africa's 54 countries declined to support the UN-sponsored resolution condemning Ru in Russia, and only about 40 out of 198 countries have actually imposed sanctions on Russia. Secondly, you know, uh, what is often understated and underrealized is that the West is far more important for India than Russia is. Russia's economy is half the size of India's economy. Our trade has been stagnating at around $10 billion for the past decade. And of our economic interest and trade with Europe and the United States is by a factor of eight or 10 much more important. And the West is truly much more important for our modernization and development. But as I said, you know, those are the compulsions under which we have to take this position. Uh, one lesson that India has learned, and in fact learned a few years ago, is that uh, the, the crisis in Ukraine has impressed upon the need to accelerate the process of the rapid modernization and expansion of our domestic industrial base, you know, which is vital for our uh, strategic autonomy, and this is the only way for us to remove our excessive dependence on uh, Russia. And finally, I would say, uh, two things. One, that despite the public statements and rhetoric in the West. Okay. Can we continue? Okay. Uh, so thank you very much for your patience, but thanks to that we'll have Jorge live. Uh, well, we can see Jorge. We can see you here. So the, the audience cannot, uh, cannot, cannot see you, but we can assure you that Jorge is in a, in a good shape. He's very happy. I don't know what time is it in, in Mexico right now, in your city? It's an email in the morning. Oh, okay, so it's acceptable, I'm yeah. just saying. So it's not 6 a.m. or, you know, 4 a.m. 
Uh, Rob, can we continue with the, with the perspective of New Zealand? What's the perspective of New Zealand? Because we are quite familiar in Poland with the Australian perspective, mm. but what about New Zealand? Well, I was going to speak more broadly, in fact, and uh, I thought that I would speak, and I was asked to speak about New Zealand, Australia, and the Southeast Asian states as well. So I'll speak a little bit more broad broadly, but I'll certainly include New Zealand in in my coverage. And in looking at these uh, these states and how they've reacted, it's not surprising that we see very diverse reactions. They're the kind of diverse re reactions that reflect the Indo-Pacific region as a whole, which is very much a region, unlike Europe, of unlike-minded states. So different responses from those different actors in the Indo-Pacific. And let me begin by saying a little bit about those who have stood by Ukraine. And in the case of the ones I'm covering, that means Australia, New Zealand and Singapore. And those um, three countries have really taken similar positions to Japan and South Korea uh, within, within the Indo-Pacific. Australia, in particular, has given full-throated support to Ukraine and has um, has really um, in many in many ways been the strongest supporter within the Indo-Pacific of Ukraine uh, befitting its role as a very close US US ally. It's condemned the Russian invasion very strongly. It is providing funding for military support. It's sending its Bushmaster armored vehicles to to Ukraine, and really, what the what the Ukraine uh, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia has done for Australia is really confirmed its position as a leading ally of the United States and a country that takes a particular position in the world and in the Indo Indo Pacific. And it's very much in line with its uh, uh, participation in the Quad, alongside India and Japan and the United States, and its more recent participation in AUKUS, the Australian-UK-American uh, initiative. Uh, so, so far, in terms of the countries that I'm covering, for Australia, it's very much com confirmation of its position in the world and its position in the region. In the case of New Zealand, it's somewhat, it's somewhat different. Uh, New Zealand always likes to differentiate itself from Australia. New Zealand is not an active treaty ally of the United States and has not been for some, for some time since the 1980s. And New Zealand very much values its independent foreign policy. However, the Ukraine, Ukraine uh, crisis has continued a more recent shift in New Zealand foreign policy. Which has seen the United States, uh, which has seen New Zealand moving once again closer to some traditional allies, having a less ambivalent position in response to aspects of Chinese assertiveness, for example. So, with Ukraine, what we've seen New Zealand do is um, take some steps that it would not have done in the past. For instance, New Zealand had relied on the United Nations to authorize sanctions, it did not have an autonomous capacity to issue sanctions against Russia when this occurred. And as a result, it had to pass legislation in Parliament to now have that autonomous sanctions capacity, and New Zealand has joined the sanctions against, against Russia as a result of that. There's been strong uh, multi-party support for that stance across the New Zealand, New Zealand political, uh, political spectrum. So New Zealand is a country that tends to uh, much be much more in favor of multilateral multilateral approaches to regional and global order, um, it's very comfortable in that kind of setting rather than being, uh, being confined to an alliance setting. New Zealand has become, begun to shift somewhat as a result of Ukraine. And I would say it's anal analogous to what has happened here in Europe with respect to Sweden, Finland and Switzerland. And in a sense, New Zealand is a kind of Switzerland of the Indo-Pacific as far as this, uh, as this conflict is concerned. One thing that has um, 
That has animated the New Zealand response though and is consistent with its earlier stances is a strong emphasis on rules-based approaches and that is one, one aspect of New Zealand's response that is completely consistent with the stance it's taken uh, both a long time ago as an American ally and in more recent years as a champion of an independent foreign policy and multilateralism in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so that's the um, that's the New Zealand stance. Singapore is the only ASEAN member that has taken a strong stance in support of Ukraine. The um, Singaporean High Commissioner to New Zealand emailed me while I was here to say that I would be pleased that Singapore had taken what he called a principled stance on the issue, has joined uh, both in condemnation of Russia and in, sa in sanctions against Russia as well. Like New Zealand, Singapore is a small state that really values a rules-based order. And I think that New Zealand and Singapore, who have in recent years been talking about an enhanced partnership as small states in the Indo-Pacific, I think they will move closer together as a result of, uh, of their responses, very similarly aligned responses on the Ukraine war. That leaves the other states I was going to cover and that is the ASEAN, ASEAN states. And we've seen um, many of them join in the UN vote condemning Russia, but for the most part, some have abstained, uh, for the most part, their responses have been much more muted. As, um, as Professor Jane noted, with, with Indonesia, a much more cautious, uh, much more cautious, neutral approach. Most of them have not certainly supported, supported sanctions. Many of them abstained on the vote in the human, uh, to eject Russia from the Human Rights Council, for example. And the question is why? Why, unlike Singapore, have most of them taken this approach? And I think it comes down to a similar, uh, similar sorts of reasons for, to those that Professor Jane outlined for India, and that is interests and concerns about their relation with Russia, and in many cases, like India, being dependent, for example, uh, Vietnam relies heavily on Russian, Russian armaments, being reliant on Russia uh, for, for those. And what's more, there's also a sense, I think, when Professor Halijak mentioned that China viewed this as an intra-European war. Uh, I think there's a real sense in the ASEAN group, for the most part, that this is a war that's far, far from their region, that doesn't directly affect their interest, and it's not their fight. And the other aspect, I think, is that they see the conflict through the lens of great power conflict as well. And ASEAN states are very wary of the dominance of great powers. And one of the things that ASEAN has always been about is to try and ensure that the ASEAN states are not the creatures of great powers, but instead that the ASEAN states act as the regional conductor through ASEAN centrality. So I think there's an element of that. Um, one of the unfortunate sides of um, looking at it in that way, of course, is that they tend to deny Ukraine any agency in this in this conflict, and we can perhaps return to that in questions. Um, in terms of um, implications of this, I think it's obvious that we're seeing very transactional approaches on the parts of many states in the region in response to the Ukraine Ukraine crisis, uh, drawing on on interests, but paying relatively little attention to values and to rules for, for, for that matter. And I think if you look at it through this kind of realist lens, uh, two questions come to mind. And you can see them from both sides of the equation. For those that have supported uh, the Ukraine, will New Zealand, Singapore, Australia, will their interests be hurt by supporting Ukraine and condemning Russia? On the other hand, will the ASEAN states that have not lined up enthusiastically to condemn Russia, will their interests be hurt by not having done so? I think in both cases, the answer is no. And whether one is talking about those that have supported Ukraine or those that have uh, stayed more neutral, in both cases, you could argue that they are very much not just acting on values, but acting on interests in both cases. So if one were, were standing back 
and looking at it from the perspective of, particularly from Europe and the United States, the Atlantic perspective, or perhaps what we might call the West Plus, the Atlantic powers plus Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, New Zealand, Australia, and Singapore. If one looks at it from this perspective, I think that if one's looking for a strategy to respond to those states like the ASEAN ones that have stood that have stood aside, a strategy to, to um, engage with India on the issue as well, I think that what needs to be stressed uh, by those powers, both in the region and from this part of the world, is that Russia is essentially challenging fundamental constitutive aspects of the international order through violating uh, territoriality, through its challenges to sovereignty, and of course alongside that, committing all sorts of violations of human rights and war crimes. And I think that's what needs to be stressed in, in having uh, certain democracies engage with others in the region and the, Euro the Europeans and the Americans engaging with the region as well, is to talk about the importance of a, a rules-based order. Because a rules-based order is actually more important in a region where you have so much diversity and so many unlike-minded states than it is in one where you have many like-minded like states. So, uh, and of course, the example of the South China Sea stands out. Uh, Ukraine is an object lesson in showing what happens when rules aren't observed. And what does that mean for various claimant states in the South China Sea as they respond to Chinese actions in that, in that area? And also I would say that if indeed we're going to put a stress on rules-based approaches, then we shouldn't be lecturing the ASEAN states or others around the world about rules if we in that West Plus do not also adhere to rules. And it's critical that the Western Alliance and those who align with that uh, alliance, either directly as allies like, the, like Australia or a little more indirectly like the New Zealands and Singapores of the world, it's very important that we ensure that all of us are consistent in adherence to rules. It means the United States thinking a little more about UNCLOS, for example, the International Criminal Court, etc. So I think that needs to be borne in mind. But what I would say by way of conclusion is that it is very dangerous for us to frame the Ukraine crisis as a, a dichotomous conflict between autocracy and democracy. Because if we do that, we lose many opportunities. We lose the opportunities for that West Plus to engage with India, to engage with Indonesia. And I think it must be a much more nuanced message that is, that is sent out that puts much more emphasis on the importance of rules-based forms of order, regionally and globally as well. And if we do that, we have a much greater chance, I think, of accommodating diversity and we also have a much greater chance of ensuring stability and avoiding, and avoiding conflict. And above all, it means that that can unleash the power of diplomacy rather than diplomacy of power. I'll conclude on that point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll talk about the Middle Eastern perspective. Right? Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, I will briefly present uh, the Middle Eastern uh, perspective on war in Ukraine. and. Uh, and uh, what is important on the beginning is to uh, to, to, to mention that uh, it is not easy to uh, make a simple generalization uh, if we are talking about the regional perspective, Middle Eastern perspective on the war in Ukraine, because each country uh, in the Middle East um, present a particular view and particular interests um, on the war with Ukraine. Uh, and um, uh, Middle East leaders in general are trying to uh, uh, stand in the middle position or present the middle position. I mean, they, uh, they are not eager to see either the US or Russia uh, declare a decisive victory in the confrontation over the Ukraine, but they are uh, in the pressure to pick a side. American or Russian, of course. So I will provide the brief overview of the political, security and uh, economic consequences of the war in Ukraine for the Middle East. Starting from the political 
uh, issue, uh, what is the most important uh, remark or conclusion is that the Arab leadership position on the war with Ukraine is a function of their relationship with the US and Russia. And this is most important um, political uh, consequence. Most of them are neutral, but we can find, of course, both pro-Russian and pro-Ukrainian voices and actions made by regional leaders. And for many regional leaders, this remains a challenge to not undermine their friendly relations with both Moscow and Washington, but at the same time, some Arab leaders want to send a signal that to the West, to the US, basically, that they will not live up to all their expectations. And um, we could see that on the example of the uh, United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia position toward the war in Ukraine, um, uh, uh, because, as we know, uh, United States, uh, during the Biden administration, um, uh, limited its support for the war in Yemen, for example, which is led by uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, United Arab uh, Emirates. So this was one of the reasons why United Arab Emirates refrained from voting on a draft resolution condemning the invasion in the United Nations Security Council. There has been a long list of Western scenes that are presented in the Arab media, uh, beginning from uh, the abandonment by the US of allies such as Hosni Mubarak in Egypt during the uh, Arab Spring, uh, to its refusal to respond to Bashar al-Assad crossing the red line uh, in Syria, to Obama's statement that Saudi Arabia should learn share the region, region with the radical leaders of the Republic of Iran. Uh, and last uh, actions made by uh, Biden, which is the pledge to sign a nuclear deal with Iran, remain something that Arab leaders cannot accept. Um, so this is, uh, uh, this is something that led uh, Arab Gulf states, oil states, to uh, reject uh, Biden's request to increase oil production. If West call Putin a criminal and do not call the criminal George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, Ronald, Donald Rumsfeld and Colin Powell who occupied Iraq, then something is wrong. We can find such a statement in the Al Jazeera, for example. Yes. So uh, many of these arguments had more to do with anti-American sentiments than with any real sympathy for the Russian uh, invasion. And as I mentioned, regional leaders are trying to remain politically neutral. This position stems from conflicting priorities between Arab leaders and the Biden administration. Many regional leaders over the past decade have expanded their relations with Moscow, especially after the Arab Spring, after 2010, both in response to Russia's return to the region as a major external power, I mean in Syria particularly, but not only. Russia expanded their relations with Egypt, for example, um, on the military and political level. And on the other hand, Russia, for example, um, gets support uh, from uh, Bashar al-Assad regime in Syria. So the goal of neutrality of the regional leaders is to maintain official relations with Moscow and Washington and do not burn bridges with these two powers. Uh, so um, this is the political uh, dimension. The second uh, is the economic uh, dimension uh, of, of this war in Ukraine. And um, the first is the gas and oil. As we know, the invasion, invasion uh, will have a significant long-term impact on the gas sector. The Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline has been suspended. And this opened up an opportunity for the, the Eastern Mediterranean gas, gas pipeline project from Israel via Cyprus and Greece to Italy. 
if it will be supported by US, because as we know, US um, limited its support for, for this uh, pipeline project. Iran, for example, also realized that it could fill Russia's gas vacuum if Putin's international isolation increases and becomes a burden on his allies. Uh, after Russia has used the US and international sanction against Iran for a long time, things could be reversed if the nuclear deal will be signed between uh, US and uh, Iran. So the, uh, the, the, the Tehran uh, um, uh, can be uh, benefited uh, from, from this arrangement. However, of course, the logistical and diplomatic arrangements uh, may take some time uh, to, 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 to make it happen. Uh, of course, all oil exported countries, middle uh, Persian Gulf states, Arab Persian Gulf states, basically, uh, are uh, among those who are likely to benefit economically from the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, but also Turkey and Iran as well, whose trade with Russia may be strengthened despite US sanctions. And meanwhile, the UAE, United Arab Emirates, could provide further benefits as financial and trading center for Russian investors. As we know, Russia somewhere has to go for the vacation, somewhere has to locate its um, money. Yes, so uh, such a state like United Arab Emirates or uh, Turkey <laughs> comes for, for help, for support. And second economic uh, dimension is the food security. The war in Ukraine also has a negative impact on food security in Egypt, Tunisia, Syria and Lebanon, but gives some economic benefits to the Gulf Cooperation Council countries and Iraq. The Russian attack um, disrupted energy and wheat supplies, which meant an, incre an increase in oil and bread prices, which could lead to social unrest in some Arab countries if the crisis prolonged, as we remember the uh, experience, for example, from Arab Spring. Uh, this was one of the reasons uh, why the revolution in Arab um, happened. Uh, several countries buy large amounts of wheat from Ukraine and Russia while some, such as Arab states of the Persian Gulf, have sufficient reserves. Others, <coughs> such as Lebanon, do not, making the prospect of shortages very real. Uh, though no one has yet imposed sanctions on imports of, of Russian grain, it is becoming increasingly difficult for importers to buy grain from Russia due to its problems with transferring funds uh, to Russian companies and ship uh, insurance. And the third, last uh, dimension is the security and stability of the region, of the Middle East. Uh, and this is also a very important conclusion. In the Arab world, many Arab leaders, political leaders, are concluding that um, nuclear weapons make a difference. Yes, which Russia, Russia has, Iraq hasn't got, and Ukraine gave up. This makes a difference, yes, in all this war. So it is becoming more and more popular view that a nuclear weapon is one of the method, a way uh, to, um, uh, to um, ensure the security in the region. Uh, and, of course, it is becoming also more and more popular that if the U.S. doesn't want to guarantee security to Arab states, it should say it clearly and directly. Otherwise, the U.S. policy will generate uh, such a, uh, dual reactions and such a positions in the middle. And uh, as Arabs see the U.S. role in the region this way, regional leaders are beginning to look for another option to ensure security and deterrence. As a result, in the eyes of many Arabs, America's impressive military assets throughout the Middle East are a smokescreen that masks a withdrawal of commitment and determination. The serious ones know that they will not find him in Moscow or Beijing. Uh, some may turn to Israel, who can certainly help, but this country with less than a million people is not a 
superpower. So the answer, if any, return to Washington. Uh, and in view of the US-Russian proxy war in Ukraine, it seems unlikely that Russian and Western diplomats will be able to resolve um, conflicts that or crises that are happening in the Libya, in the Yemen, um, uh, in, in, and in other parts of the uh, of the region. And concluding, uh, if states cannot achieve a security guarantee, we should not be surprised to wake one of uh, one 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 morning to find that. Some of these states have drawn the not irrational conclusion that security can only be found in the pursuit of their own nuclear weapon. And that's a sobering lesson to take from Ukraine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Roger. This Middle Eastern perspective, well, actually, thank you very much for your, I want to say, short presentations, presenting, you know, the, the, the perspectives, non-European perspectives. Uh, I have this feeling that we are missing this U.S. Mm. factor presentation because uh, what your presentations, all presentations have in common is that all of you mentioned the United States and there is nobody to defend uh, the American position, right? So I don't know whether I should do that or not, but anyway, um, uh, my, my question would be, okay, what are the perspectives? What, we have like 20 uh, minutes left for, for discussion. I mean, the audience, you are uh, you are welcome to write your questions using the chat option, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, I for um, might have a couple. the moment, as I can see, there are no questions from the audience. Oh, there is one. Okay, so we'll continue with these questions. I, I promise that I will I will refer to them in a few minutes, right? But uh, if you could just uh, tell us, um, I mean, all, all our um, uh, distinguished uh, participants, panelists, if you could just. Um, tell us what is your perspective and what's the future? I mean, uh, what the future position of the regions or countries uh, may be vis-a-vis -vis the current, the ongoing conflict in, in Ukraine in one minute, right? If if possible, right? Can we start with uh, Professor Halichak? So in order... Uh, uh, maybe uh, 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 in another row. Okay. Maybe. Okay, okay, so... So, Jaya, so what well, <coughs> will, the, will the, the India's position be the same, or you do think that it may change? You know, it's generally said that it is professionally hazardous yes. for an academic to look into the crystal ball That's why and predict I'm the asking, future. That's why I'm asking you this question, because you know it would no, be. I, I don't think <laughs> the Indian position will change uh, tangibly uh, because. Uh, you know, despite our urging a return to diplomacy and uh, dialogue. Uh, a lot would depend upon what uh, Putin actually thinks and does and how prolonged the war is. My personal fear is that uh, uh, I think uh, the war is not likely to end soon. And even if it does, you know, uh, Ukraine is definitely not going to be in a position to accept this kind of uh, seizure of this entire eastern coast, which denies it access to warm water ports. So my fear is that the West would continue to, you know, uh, supply arms uh, to Ukraine and you will see some form of fighting going on. Uh, there has been some commentary in the, uh, amongst former senior bureaucrats who have suggested uh, that a possible uh, future scenario for Ukraine would be if it were non-aligned or neutral, you know, like Finland and so on. But that is not a widely shared opinion, you know, it belongs to a small segment of the strategic community. Uh, but apart from that, you know, there has been no such official opinion about what should be done. But we all hope that fighting ends quickly and a solution is found. Rob? Okay. Okay. Yeah, you want then to... we'll continue with... Okay. Uh, um, okay. Let him go. Also, I'd like to remind you that uh, President Biden, uh, during his visit uh, uh, to Poland uh, a few days ago, made a speech in which he expressed the direct aim of U.S. strategy to make Russia uh, very weak, to uh, uh, to make Russia less uh, powerful in economic terms by uh, preventing Russia to. Uh, to grow economically. 
So his aim, as he stated, is to out uh, Russia from the 20 most uh, powerful economically economies. When Russia will be ranked as a 21st, now is ranked as a 13th uh, country uh, in terms of GDP, 13 on 12. So when Russia will be 21 or 22nd uh, or 25 ranked, because in the next, uh, in coming years, there will be no GDP growth in Russia, uh, for sure. This year, China, Russia economy will contract about 10%. Next year, about one or minus one or two percent. Within five years, I do not see any chance for uh, economic growth for Russia. This is the long term perspective. After five years, Russia probably will be very weak economically stage because Russia will be totally cut off from the international financial market. Within the five years, China, Russia will not be able to borrow any cents. Russia will have to rely on its own resources only. This will happen for the first time in a contemporary history, but we will have to wait very long what will happen after five years. As far as China, I'd like to stress that China is afraid the sanction from the United States. Please uh, notice that China started to prepare for a possible sanction by uh, arranging a new uh, IT system by uh, installing all Chinese-made computers in its own country, by expelling all, by resigning all uh, of computers made by the US, uh, US firms. So China is, in my opinion, is preparing strategically for uh, uh, for a sanction from the United uh, from the uh, from the, the United uh, from the United States. This is the uh, direct effect of the Russia uh, invasion because China is afraid. If I mean so it's it's a, it's a, a good news for India. No, if I, uh, <laughs> no um, I just wanted to add to what you just said. You see, the Chinese are working with this alternate to the SWIFT system, mm -hmm. but it is very slow. It has a lot of bugs. And while the SWIFT system can move trillions of transactions very quickly, this is only able to do a few tens of thousands. So China is a long way off. But I do agree with you uh, that China is uh, definitely concerned about the kind of crippling effect which sanctions can have because China depends so much on the world economy. But you know, the usage of the renminbi as a swap currency mm -hmm. and for bilateral trade, that is an option. And if you see a clear example, for example, when the U.S. imposed sanctions on Iran, you know, China just direct dealt with it where the sanctions made no difference at all. But the problem, as you say, is about widespread, you know, tens of thousands of sanctions across the world. That might be an issue of serious concern. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rajan. Rob? Well, in questions, uh, with respect to your question about uh, whether positions are going to change in the uh, region that I, I discussed, I, I don't think so in the short and medium, medium term, whatever happens in Ukraine. I think there will probably be a doubling down in terms of the stances of Australia and uh, and Japan, South Korea, for that matter, and Taiwan and uh, and Singapore as well, I think New Zealand will move closer to that grouping. It's always it's been on the fringes of it for a while. I think it's going to move closer to that grouping, and the big question is going to be, I think, what is going to be the stance of the ASEAN states other than other than Singapore, and will they shift in some ways with the hands-off approach that they've that they've taken, and I think that's really going to be determined not so much by what ha what is happening in Ukraine, but how they view the implications of what is happening in Ukraine for the Indo-Pacific, and I think in particular concerns about. Uh, um, continued ASEAN centrality is going to mean that those states do have a vested interest in rules-based approaches 
uh, in the region at least. And so there's going to be, I think, an increasing tension for those states in extrapolating their, their strong support for rules-based approaches in the Indo-Pacific and perhaps in the South China Sea, for example, as opposed to taking a hands-off stance in, uh, with respect to Ukraine. And I suspect that being the ASEAN states, they'll be able to ride, ride that out in the, in the ASEAN way. But I, I think that that's more, the more likely prognosis for, for my part of the world. I may I add only one thing mm -hmm. that the uh, U.S. ASEAN summit is coming. Yeah. is coming. That's right, and uh, it will be extremely important. So our picture will be uh, much more clear after the final communication. Uh, I, I would add we haven't had the U.S. perspective really. I think that the other aspect of it is going to be. Um, is going to be determined in part by how the U U.S. engages in the Indo-Pacific. Um, we've seen what it's done with respect to Ukraine, how, as you've noted, the Western alliance in, uh, in transatlantic terms is stronger now than one could have, uh, certainly much stronger than one could have imagined in the past 10 years or so. Um, but the question in the Indo-Pacific is whether the United States is going to be able to use not only its political and military resources, but its economic resources to add an economic component to what it's trying to do through its free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, which everyone notes is the great missing link and the great strength that China has. And I think the extent to which the United States can combine economic instruments alongside uh, considerable soft power as well as a lot of hard power. And if it succeeds on that front, then the game changes in the Indo-Pacific. If it doesn't succeed on the economic front, then China's rise continues. In order to make uh, Hollywood more popular than Bollywood. <laughs> <laughs> this probably brings in Bollywood. <laughs> no, I, I would just add that, you know, on the 24th of May, we have the first quad summit in person in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. yeah. And though there has been speculation that, you know, US is too yeah. much focused, that the pivot to Asia has shifted to a pivot to Europe. Okay. Yeah. But I think one should not be too hasty in drawing that conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, because the elephant in the room is clearly China, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. that is where the Americans perceive as a greater yeah. geoeconomic threat. Okay, we have we have quite many questions from the audience. So let me Pick, uh, I mean, Michal Malak has, has two questions, so Michal, I will just choose one of them, okay? Because we don't have that much time. Uh, but still, okay, this one will be to, to Wojciech. And uh, Michal is asking you, how likely is that the relations between Iran and the West will improve because of the war, I mean, the conflict in Ukraine? So what's your perspective? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. I think that uh, as Middle Eastern uh, states still um, see the war in Ukraine as as uh, as a, this is not our war. So we will sit and wait, and we will wait what will happen, uh, how it will have, how will it, it will improve uh, these mutual relations. Well. I think that uh, this um, negotiation uh, of the nuclear deal uh, with Iran uh, now it's 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 um, very uh, it's 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 frozen. I mean, uh, it should be signed this deal uh, a, a few weeks or a few months ago, but it's still not. So um, I think that uh, U.S. Uh, will focus more on the Ukraine than on the Middle East. So I think that this nuclear deal maybe is not the most important um, issue in the uh, for American foreign agent and agenda, yes? So uh, answering your question, if this war will improve these relations, I think that it might, but it will be very slow and very long lasting. It will be not very quick um, change. So in, in Iran, if we take a look um, in the political scene, we also see many uh, internal division. I mean, uh, there are, of course, supporters of signing this nuclear deal and, of course, those who reject uh, any cooperation with the United States. So 
it will not be easy task, yes? But uh, the Middle East is very difficult uh, to predict the, 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 the international relations on the Middle East. So this is what I can answer on, on your question. If I may Thank add, you. you know, that uh, we are actually witnessing some, some some changes in, in the U.S. because the Biden administration, I mean, everybody is focusing on Ukraine right now, but the Biden administration is going probably to remove the Iranian Revolutionary Corps guards from, from, the, from the terrorist list. Mm -hmm. And it will be a huge game changer because it, will, it may open the way to the nuclear deal with Iran. That's the main obstacle right now. So it's very likely that they will do so. So, so we'll see what, what happens. Okay. We have uh, two more questions, and this one is, uh, Rajendra, is for you, so get ready. Uh, it's about the diversification of, uh, as I understand, of military purchase, I mean, and the purchase of military equipment for, for the Indian forces. Well, actually, for the past five years, India has been trying to diversify, and you find France, Israel, and the United States have emerged as major alternatives. But the biggest emphasis now is on a self-reliant India where we have banned over 300 types of weapon categories from direct import by saying that these now have to be co-produced in India. And uh, when the Prime Minister uh, Modi visited Paris recently for a brief, for a few hours, this was one major topic of discussion that looking ahead, uh, there would be very few flat platforms that India would import directly, that co-production in India. And this, I think, also is an opportunity for Central Europe uh, which has declined in terms of military exports to India. That is the way forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, the final question is from Zantush. And Zantush is quite right, we are, because we are missing this. I mean, uh, North African dimension was covered by, by, by Wojciech, but we are, actually we are missing this sub-Saharan uh, dimension. And Zantush's uh, question to all of, all of you is, how would you uh, see, measure, or predict the African role in the Russian war in Ukraine? So that what, as I understand, what the what the African states, what the role can be, right, in 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 the in in this conflict, or whether they will take sides or not. So, what is your perspective? Well, the only thing I can say is that I have it here that uh, almost uh, almost half of the Africa's 54 countries declined to support the UN resolution condemning Russia. And the second thing I think you have to appreciate is that China is the number one player in Africa today, whether it is trade, it is FDI, or it is credits, though there is a negative side to that as well, as we see in Kenya and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So I think Africa is going to be somewhat restrained on this uh, because the American role is not very pronounced in the region, so largely neutral. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. our second mm -hmm. question on okay. the uh, obstacle to Western sanction. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's the one which I. I, I... The United States could create a big enough uh, trade partnership with Russia. This is an essential question, very good question, because if we assume that Russia will be cut off uh, from the Western markets uh, uh, in exports and in imports, so how Russia will substitute its foreign trade? Of course, the potential candidate is China. But the question is, is China will be able to substitute uh, the Western market? Not so much, because first of all, China is very cautious about the uh, imports of gas and oil from Russia. China do not repeat the uh, fault of the West by relying on gas and oil and the uh, import share of gas and oil will not exceed 8%. Currently, China imports more gas from Turkmenistan than from Russia. So China is very clever in diversification. So what China uh, could offer for Russia? Consumer goods, uh, because China uh, China is well known a uh, producer of such consumer goods. But the question is, will Russian consumers accustomed to the consuming of Western goods <laughs> will be able to accept the Chinese one products? This is the problem of culture. 
This is a very interesting contradiction in Russian attitude. Putin used to say that NATO is an inherent source of insecurity. But at the same time, the Russian oligarch plays their wealth in NATO countries, mm -hmm. in NATO banks. They located their money, fortune, in NATO in NATO countries. They go shopping in NATO countries. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> best shopping <laughs> sort, uh, your, I, I, It's hard to airports. imagine it, that Russian wealth consumers will go to Beijing or to Shanghai. There are, of course, very, you know, uh, wealth centers of business and uh, shopping centers. But this is the distance, eight hours by flight and the culture, because the culture matters. And the Russian, Russia, Russian people has a sense of a, uh, indirect, I would say, superiority over the Chinese. This is a deeply rooted. This is, uh, I know, uh, uh, I, 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 I spend a lot of time uh, in, in, you know, in discussion with the, with the Russians on it. So, concluding, the China will not substitute the Western markets for, uh, for uh, Russia natural uh, uh, products, resources, and China will not substitute the Western products. In Russia, because when Russia will be cut off from the financial market, so the power purchasing of Russia will be very low, no doubt. We will, if we only imagine the situation where Russia will be cut off from the financial market, I think there's. Final also, remarks. We have like two more minutes or something. I think there's also the question of Chinese concerns about secondary sanctions and what it would mean if China did step into that role, what it would mean, uh, I think, less importantly for China's relations with Russia, but more what it would mean for China's relations with Europe, the United States, and a number of states in the Indo-Pacific as well. And I think Russia does not count as much in their calculations, especially on the economic front, as those other states do. Yeah, yeah. because, you know, China is very, you know, is pragmatic. Yes pragmatic not ideologically motivated this is the first so so uh, the prospect for russia are very very weak it's because china will not substitute him nothing mm -hmm. i think we can if you agree we will stop here no, if we start a discussion on this now yes. that will take another webinar uh, <laughs> i think it's like you know volume one maybe we should think of you know volume, volume two why not so i think the audience i don't know but probably you will share my feeling that it was a very nice seminar a very nice webinar and i think that we we could continue i mean we could meet in a, in a couple of months and see what's the situation on the ground, what's the situation in Ukraine, and whether our perspectives uh, have changed or not, right? So, but yeah, let me thank you very much for your... Thank you. Uh, thank I you. wanted to say active participation. Um, big thanks to, to Jorge. Jorge, I know that you can hear us, so muchas gracias. Once again, thank you very much for your participation. God bless Mexico. I <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the, the closest ally of the United States. <laughs> all the best, all the best. Uh, I would like to thank the audience and uh, please follow our channel on YouTube, please follow our social media. Uh, a big thank you to Maciej who was hiding somewhere there in the background and was a mastermind for these technical, uh, let's say, arrangements. So once again, thank you very much and see you, hear you soon. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. I'd like you to remind you that this is the after yeah, the webinar that 